Thank you, Chris. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. It's a pleasure and also an honor to be with you uh, here today. And as you may have figured, if you label a Congress with something that says green, uh, it, uh, we're interested. Nevertheless, I think you already mentioned trade is an essential uh, building block of any prosperous economy. And our European ports, I believe, um, are responsible for the channeling of seven, more than 74% of the goods imported and exported in the EU. And they also um, channel uh, almost 40% of the intra-EU trade uh, that we know. International maritime traffic has clearly been booming over the last uh, decades, although not spared from the economic crisis like many sectors uh, there. Nevertheless, it's therefore indeed important that we keep um, our efforts ongoing to green our ports uh, as part of our attempts to achieve our sustainable development goals at local, national, European and even global level. Greening, however, has uh, very many dimensions uh, going over concerns over maritime or land-based ecosystems, air pollution, and since many years also climate change. The last uh, port policy review published by the Commission, therefore, uh, also pays a lot of attention to uh, trying to bring on uh, greening solutions, including on the greening of infrastructure charges, etc. Likewise, the latest proposal on alternative fuels uh, suggests that uh, ports put in place LNG fueling points and there's also funds foreseen for that uh, purpose. Uh, shore side el electricity is also part of those solutions. These and other topics will be discussed at length, I believe also during your conference. However, I would like to use the few minutes uh, that I have available to zoom in on a few uh, headlines that we pick up from the in-depth review of the European Air Policy Review that we have been undertaking since uh, 2011, January 2011. And actually, as we speak, we're uh, finalizing uh, our analysis uh, within the Commission. Um, I wish to apologize for our friends that joined us from outside Europe, but I can tell you that air pollution is not a problem that is restrained to Europe. Uh, you may recall that the OECD in its uh, 2050 outlook uh, said that they believe air pollution will become the most uh, important environment and health challenge for the coming decades. I just need to figure out how to move that forward. Voila. Okay. Um, trying to squeeze a lot of things in a few uh, slides, uh, and that won't always be easy, but I think it's fair to say that when it comes to air pollution in Europe, we've booked a few notable successes, which you can see in the upper left corner. We have indeed brought down uh, substantial, uh, or brought along substantial reductions of major uh, air pollutants. I think uh, SO2 is amongst the, the success stories. Uh, we've gotten rid of uh, lead in fuel, etc. Um, that means, for example, that if you look at the right hand, uh, right, lower right corner, that the problem of acidification that was once considered unsurmountable, and the problem of acid rain, that we now consider more or less resolved. In terms of environment, eutrophication or excess nitrogen deposition uh, on the territory is becoming the prime concern also uh, linked to uh, biodiversity and other uh, objectives. However, if you look at uh, the map of Europe in the middle and the lower end with all the air quality monitors, we clearly see that we still have a lot of problems with our current standards. The monitors turn too red for PM10, NO2 and ozone. We have looked in detail um, at these issues, trying to understand and recalculating what the ultimate uh, problems were. In fact, air pollution is sometimes uh, called the silent killer or the invisible killer. If you add up all the impacts, we're counting over 400,000 premature deaths directly attributable to air pollution in Europe, and these are figures for 2010. Equally important, it doesn't always have to be that fatalistic, but we count 
almost 570 million restricted activity days, people that cannot go to work or to school because of asthma and other diseases, which has a direct bearing on labor productivity and the economy. As I said before, acidification, I think we're, we're seeing the end of the tunnel, so that's more or less resolved. However, uh, more than 60% of European areas are uh, exposed to uh, eutrophication beyond what ecosystems can recuperate. We have too many air quality monitors in non-compliance and therefore we have currently 17 member states heading for court for failing to achieve the air quality standards uh, for PM. Uh, noting, by the way, that if you look at the lower box, that those standards are uh, considered obsolete by the World Health Organization. The picture is not uh, much more rosy when it comes to NO2, and for ozone, there's an equal uh, important problem. Ozone, by the way, also causes significant losses in agricultural yields and other damages. So why do we have that problem? For particulate matter is a, is a pollutant that is uh, influenced by many sources, so transport features still today as a very important uh, focal area but if you talk to the city experts, also small-scale combustion and domestic heating contribute significantly to the exceedances we know today. NOx and ammonia emissions, uh, funnily enough, contribute to PM contribution, so it's not been easy, but we need to explain to farmers that ammonia emissions from agriculture do contribute to PM exceedances in towns. So there is a lot of awareness and engagement still to be done. Unfortunately, the hemispheric air pollution levels are going up as well. So even if we uh, improve at the local level, the challenge coming in from the background is increasing. For nitrogen dioxide, I think we can keep it much simpler. The problem is related to diesel engines, including the latest vintage of uh, vehicles we buy in the shops, and we need to get, come to grips with that. But there's also other diesel engines, and that's where we also look at non-road machinery, again, small-scale combustion, inland shipping, etc. Ground-level ozone, again, NOx, VOC, and very much also a background issue. We shaved off the peaks in Europe, but we see the background levels uh, increasing, which means that methane becomes an issue that we need to table at international level. Eutrophication is more or less an agricultural story, but we've also noticed uh, weaknesses at the general level in terms of une uneven capacities at local, national, or regional level to adequately assess and manage uh, air quality. And we have had competence barriers, cities suffering from diesel uh, exhaust, and national authorities continuing to promote diesel. We need to rebalance those issues. This, uh, I think, is less important for this group, but it is quite an issue. Uh, this just shows that on gasoline, we've been doing pretty well in reducing the emissions in line with the legislation. When it comes to diesel, despite the tightening of legislation, real world emissions, as we call it, kept be being very high. And this is no longer acceptable. That needs to be tackled. So 17 members in, in front of court. How will that evolve over time? We believe that if member states continue to implement existing EU legislation, and continue to work on uh, local and national air quality programs. And by the way, I understand uh, Antwerp was the first city introducing low emission zones, so I'm very interested to see how that is going to work. And congratulations anyway to take air pollution serious. Um, what these things are showing is that um, we have analyzed and compliance is possible under uh, the existing legal framework. So we don't need to offload a lot of new legislation, which would, by the way, take too much time before it becomes effective. And it is therefore our vision that we can uh, work with the member state to avoid going into second stage at court procedure and therefore avoid penalties which can run in the billions. Sorry, where is that going? Okay. How is that problem going to evolve? Again, if we have all legislation implemented, we will still see unacceptable levels of air pollution impacts. And I just pick one, um, air pollution premature deaths go from 400,000 to over 300,000 still in 2030. 
So that can hardly be called acceptable. It is about 10 times the damage that we see on uh, road accidents. External costs associated with that are flabbergasting. They range between 300 and 900 billion euros per year. So we looked at all these things and we set out uh, objectives, first of all, to try to get rid of the non-compliance issue and work constructively with the member states, though, <coughs> excuse me, firm when it comes to uh, infringements, good faith, we reward bad faith, we have to act. And then we need to set out the longer term objectives for 2025 and 2030. It is vital, we believe, to maintain the long term perspective. I'm just going to rush you through very, very quickly. So again, for 2020, a lot of focus needed on implementing existing uh, legislation. For this forum, I think it's vital to bear in mind that the uh, IMO standards for sulfur, be it in SECAS or other European waters, are really implemented as foreseen and enforced, I should say, and I believe also the port authorities, we need to work with you very closely to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> for the 2020 perspective, we will also come out with non-regulatory programs to support the local authorities, national authorities, etc., to strengthen their capacity to both assess and manage. If you don't assess properly, you will be targeting your measures on the wrong sources and spend money in vain. Okay. Um, this is more or less unreadable. That's also the one that uh, I will just annotate for you and then we will uh, come back with the latest figures which we're uh, turning from the analysis into the presentation. But the good news is that we have identified a cost-effective way forward uh, for the period 2025 and 2030 that would allow us to reduce the health impacts, for example, by about one-third over the baseline provisions that I showed you before. All that is possible uh, in a way where the benefits uh, estimated at 45 billion a year about tenfold exceed the costs, 4.6 billion per year. However, if you reintroduce all the gains also on labor productivity losses through improved health and uh, reduced restricted activity days, we basically uh, assess that we can do this on an economically neutral way and even add over 100,000 jobs on the ticket. Uh, we will do that through the National Emission Ceilings Directives for those who are into that uh, topic and we will also uh, come forward with a proposal to plug uh, an existing gap when it comes to combustion installations, namely to cover the regulation of combustion installations below 50 megawatt up to one megawatt. Above 50 megawatt we have the industrial emissions directive also in our portfolio. Below we have the eco design managed by our colleagues from DG Inner. And that is a very important gap to plug also to make sure that our air pollution, energy and climate policies work in sync. Because what we see now is that air pollution, uh, climate change and uh, energy policies do contribute to air pollution objectives. However, beyond 2020, that impact flattens out, and that is because what you gain on the fossil fuel uh, reduction, you lose where biomass burning is increasing, and that is a, is a concern we need to tackle. I think I'm going to leave it more or less uh, at that uh, for the time being. We are currently consulting with our other services in the final stage, and the Commission is set to deliberate uh, the outcome of the analysis and make adopt its proposals and initiatives uh, late November. I hope this gave you some scene setter for the rest of the conference. I wish you good luck with your proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, good morning on my turn. A warm welcome in Antwerp. And Chris, uh, this is a real honor and a pleasure uh, to host the Greenport Conference for the second time. And in a certain way, Greenport is coming home since uh, the very first edition had place here in Antwerp in uh, 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you have uh, participated yesterday afternoon in the launch of our second sustainability report. And those who were not there, 
we'll learn more about this uh, event further on during this conference as a representative of the port industry will provide more explanation on this topic. So I will not go uh, or to enter in detail. However, uh, this event illustrates very well how environmental management is dealt with in the port of Antwerp and how it is part of an integrated and in a broader policy of sustainability management. It reflects uh, how environmental management is a job for everybody and not just for the environmental manager or a particular department of the Global uh, Port Authority. The sustainability report contains a dashboard for our port which integrates the three most important aspects in this respect. Economic performance, uh, perf performance indicators, social indicators and, of course, last but not least, environmental indicators. And if we want to continue to play a role in the Champions League of the port world, that's our ambition, not in football, but uh, concerning Antwerp, but concerning the port we are, and we have this ambition, we have to perform on all aspects covered in the sustainability report, and we have to do that in an integrated way. Where for too long, environmental management was considered a threat and therefore relegated to the back burden, and I admit also in our organization, we have learned meanwhile that environmental management can also be an opportunity and it can improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of what is really going on in the port. It can, in fact, be a full integra integral part of port management. Ladies and gentlemen, strong environmental management creates a strong license to operate, what we really need. And this can be illustrated also on a local base by the fact that the recent approval of the spatial development plan for the port of Antwerp, and we worked at it for about 13 years, by our, that the, this plan for the port by our competent authorities, allowing us to further develop and extend our port during the next decades, another 1,073 hectares, it only became possible with, an, a, with a, a package, a companion of environmental measures that is, being to, that is being implemented and has to be implemented in the years to come, and thus providing sufficient guarantees to the surroundings. Strong environmental management also equals a strong unique selling position and indeed an attractive port is a port providing the shipping industry with excellent environmental services. Ships powered by LNG or using scrubber technology are welcome in our port and will be served. Ships needing to offload their waste can count on highly efficient infrastructure which is at their disposal and indeed an area where the environmental quality is managed and guaranteed is always more attractive to an investor compared to an area where the environment quality is not managed or available. A reliable port is a port where things are organized in such a way that obtaining a permit is a smooth and reliable process and not something on which the outcome is completely uncertain and depend on a number of factors which are not under control. We just changed some words about it, Isabel, a few uh, moments ago. Ladies and gentlemen, a well-defined level playing field is important for sustainable business development. And indeed, with reliable and well-founded knowledge, it will be possible to conduct debates on a rational basis and not on an emotional basis, on a set of emotions. It may be clear that in all these aspects, the Port Authority can make the difference and take up its role just as it does in other fields or aspects of port management, and with the same tools as it does in, the other, in these other fields. Environmental management is a part of a port management, which in the end should not be looked at in a different way. Port management and environmental management go hand in hand. And indeed, in line with the ESPO's Green Guide, the role of port authorities will be the light motive during this Congress. We will not only focus on best practices in terms of new technologies for day-to-day -day port operations, but we will also address these issues 
on another level, which factors make or break a technological, technological innovation? And just a few examples. What are the triggers to accelerate market penetration of a green technology? What are the key elements to turn a concept or a technique into a success or a failure? This is where environmental, environmental policy pops in, indeed. Strong policy in, in incentives can be given to green innovation through, for example, providing specific subsidy schemes, adopting clear regulatory frameworks, approving uniformed technical standards, and so on and so on. And more specifically, the upcoming Congress will look into the role that European port authorities can play when it comes to greening their port. And indeed, most European ports can play an important role through an innovative environmental policy of investing, stimulating, supporting, anticipating, facilitating, and informing. And this is one of the key messages embedded in the ESPO 2012 Green Guide, which was much appreciated by the European Commission, Mr. Thomas, and which will be further highlighted by ESPO's representative, Isabel, later on. And according to the 5E theory presented in the Green Guide, port authorities can trigger environmental breakthroughs within their port areas by exemplifying port authorities leading the way by example, enabling port authorities providing the right infrastructural and operational conditions, encouraging port authorities giving the right incentives to port users, engaging port authorities acting side by side with port users towards environmental improvement, and late, enforcing port authorities ensuring compliance with good environmental practice. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with the ESPO Green Guide, the Antwerp Port Authority is committed to taking up its role in moving towards a more sustainable port. We do believe that other port authorities show this commitment as well, although the status, the role and the power of port authorities vary, uh, vary significantly throughout the European Union. We believe that this 5E approach, which will be further highlighted in a moment, is very relevant against the background of Europe's growing attention for sound port management and for the behavior of port authorities, especially when building port infrastructure, granting land concessions, setting port due tariffs, and organizing port-related services. But most of all, the coming two days, the Antwerp Port Authority hopes to trigger a challenging debate on the ways to integrate an ambitious sustainability agenda in a highly competitive market faced with harsh and unpredictable market conditions. And we really look forward to sharing with you experiences and viewpoints on sustainable port management. We hope that this Congress will please you and, of course, that also the City of Antwerp will please you. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, and I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Greenport for organizing this conference and also thank the, the Port of Antwerp for hosting it. Um, this year, the European Seaports Organization is celebrating its 20th anniversary. And if we look back to 93, in 94 already, so one year after it was born, the first document that was released was the Environmental Code of Practice. A few years later, Ecoports was created, and so you see that uh, as from the very beginning, the European Seaports Organization has put environment and sustainability high on its agenda. And not without any success. If we look at some, some figures or some data, since 96, there are twice as many ports that have an environmental policy. In 96, only half of the ports were carrying out an environmental monitoring. Now it's, we can say, eight on 10. And since 2004, the amount of ports that publish an annual environmental review or report has doubled. 
it is clear that these results are stimulating, stimulating ESPO, stimulating the active ones to do it better, and stimulating the other ones to start. Distinguished guests, I'm happy that this year's program is in line with ESPO's Green Guide approach and the top priorities of our sector in the green in the environmental field. Air quality, waste, both the port and ship waste, the relation with the local community. Look how we can diminish the environmental externalities of a port. This session or this conference is, has also something on a session on environmental reporting and communication. And this also reflects ESPO's commitment to increase transparency in the sector. In September last month, there was the kickoff of a European research pro project, Portopia, in which ESPO is very much involved and which aims at more transparency, more measurement, one-stop shop for data. This should be the, the ultimate aim and also the environmental indicators and performance indicators will be a part of it. Dear participants, this conference is an interactive conference. Please contribute. Let people go home with ideas, with contacts. Let not finish this conference after two days, but bring the knowledge home, bring network afterwards, and share the knowledge you gathered here. It is time, also ladies and gentlemen, to bring the Green Guide a step forward. The five E's, and they were very well explained by, by Mr. Brönings from the Port of Antwerp, they should be integrated in the environmental policy statements of ports. The Green Guide, who now, and I can tell it, is also available in Italian, thanks to Assoporti, who, who did the translation, is a living document. There is an annex in it with all examples, all best practices. Please share the, your good practices, your examples. There is a template on the website of, of Ecoports on ESPO website where you can fill in your good example. And so share this example with others. Ladies and gentlemen, dear ports, join Ecoports. At this moment, 70 ports have, have adhered to Ecoports. This is okay, but it's not enough, we can do better. It's important, and it's important for you to know that it's not only the good ones, not only the front runners that should join. Because you have to see this Ecoports tool, and I, I compare it with the start to run. It's like a start to be green. And so with this EcoPods tool, the, the, the self-diagnosis method, you can really measure how your port is performing in sustainability environment. But it's looking at a mirror in, a very, in your own bathroom because no one is looking with you. So if you score badly, no one will see it. And that is very important because you can, if you score bad, bad you can know you. You have to do something better. If you score well, you can, you can sell it. So please, come to Ecoports and join the system. Um, another tool, the, the Port Environmental Review System, it's a very important tool of Ecoports. It's the only port-specific environmental management standard. So it's important to get it, but it's also important to renew it because it expires regularly, so you should, be, you should renew it regularly. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. In these 20 years of environmental engagement of ESPO Ecoports, it is clear that we do not want to compete on environment. We do not want environmental rules that distort competition. We want a level playing field. We want a bottom-up approach. We want ports to, to share knowledge. We want front runners to pull others in the right direction. And allow me in that respect to refer to your host, the Port of Antwerp. They are very, have been always active on sustainability. They are winner of different awards. Yesterday they presented again their, their sustainability report. And for many years at the Port of Antwerp have been very active in the sustainable committee of ESPO. So I think you couldn't be in a better location for this conference than in Antwerp. I thank you for your attention and wish you a fruitful conference. Thank you.